Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, and uh, yes, I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about news podcasting. Uh, I think it was about uh, 15 years ago that I was part of the team at the BBC that launched the first BBC podcast event and uh, first podcasting service. And uh, uh, then it sort of plateaued, basically. And then suddenly something's happened in the last few years and it's all kind of taken off again. Um, so um, uh, I'm mainly going to share this research that we've just published at the Reuters Institute looking at uh, the opportunities for news podcasting. It's based on interviews with around 30 publishers around the world, some of the leading publishers who are doing it. And it's really inspired by my curiosity to find out more about how this is working for news. So there's a lot of sort of general stuff around how podcasting is changing the world, but actually what's going on in news. And we, we did some work uh, looking at in detail at... Uh, what's going on in five countries, so UK, US, Australia, Sweden, and we even have a Swedish representative in the room I know, uh, and France as well. And I should say that Nathan Gallo is my co-author, who some of you may know, who has been to Hacks Hackers a, a number of times over the last year, and I'm very grateful to the work that he did in terms of the data crunching. Um, so just to, so I've got an idea, how many people in the room are listeners, are podcast fans? So that's almost everyone. That, by the way, you are not a representative audience. You know this, right? Uh, how, many, how many of you in, in the room actually produce podcasts? Wow. This is, uh, that's quite impressive. So it's about 10 or 15. Um, OK, so um, yes, they're popular, right? And uh, this is just some data. I'm mainly going to draw on, on the research that we've just published. This is just some other data. Uh, so in the UK, radio are apparently 40% increase in the last year. I'm not sure I quite believe that. Uh, Edison, gold standard in the US, 100% uh, increase in the last five years. That's about 90 million people in the US who listen to a podcast monthly. Our data on the right shows uh, that this is really being driven by younger groups. So proportionately, under 35 is much more likely to listen to a podcast, and they are discovering the wonders of audio, often for the first time. Uh, they don't, sometimes they're radio programs, they don't know they're radio programs. Uh, and the reason is because this is a kind of plugged in generation uh, who um, have their smartphones and uh, they have access to these amazing headphones now. And it's that kind of combination and they're out and about. This is a medium that really fits into their lives. Uh, and it's, it's partly the lack of friction but it's also the additional quality of the programming and the diversity of the programming that's really uh, attracting younger people. We do a survey at the beginning of every year with publishers where we ask them what are the big initiatives for them this year. And uh, you can see here that over 50% of them uh, are talking about audio and specifically about podcasts. So at the top there, daily news podcasts. I think um, we're going to hear from Tanner from The Times. The Times is just one of the latest publishers to say that they are going to be launching a daily news podcast this year and putting a lot of resources into it. But many other podcasts around Europe, daily podcasts will launch this year, uh, chat interviews, uh, serialized podcasts. I've just, just flagged up a few of the other audio opportunities that publishers are looking at. Um, so short audio for voice devices is going to be um, an increasing opportunity this year, not just for voice, actually, but also for platforms like Spotify. And then... Uh, text-to-speech services. I think we're going to see increasing possibilities there. I'm not going to talk about it much uh, tonight. And then a whole load of other spoken words as well. So that just gives you an idea of what publishers are thinking about. We are going to see significant moves from publishers this year in terms of audio. OK, what about the, um, what about the supply side? That's one of the things I was really interested to find out. Um, this is some data that we got from Chartable specifically for the report. And essentially, it shows the growth in the number of podcasts that are out there. So you can see podcast um, supply really starting to take off in around 2014. That's when Serial happened, of course, but also when Apple put the, by default, the podcast app on, on the iPhone, which was another huge spur. Again, a big boost in the last few years. So 200,000 new podcasts going into the Apple directory every year now. So that is the kind of exponential growth that, that we've seen slightly slowing down uh, now. But the thing that I wanted to know was, uh, what about news? That's all podcasts, right? So overall, we uh, categorized, um, sorry, Chartable categorized for us based on the Apple um, categorizations, all of the news podcasts, and it's about 50,000, so it's about 6% are, are news. So the majority of podcasts people are listening to are not classified as news, a lot of lifestyle, sport, all the rest of it. But when you look at the ones in the top 100, 
So the most popular podcasts, and this is the episode charts, which are more based on consumption, uh, it's 21%. So relatively small number of podcasts, but significantly bunching above their weight. And just some additional data on that. Uh, If you look at the top charts, uh, this is PodTrack, which is a kind of, um, it's an um, opt-in measure, but even so, in the US, out of all of the podcasts, the top two are, are news podcasts, all the podcasts they track. Uh, so that's the daily and, and up first. So news is uh, is very significant and is driving a lot of audiences. So one of the things we tried to do was to look at, um, try and break these down into different types. This is really hard because what is a podcast? Um, so in many cases, it's a combination, uh, it's a whole load of broadcasters who put out radio programs and they make make them available as podcasts. Is that a podcast? And then there's other people who are making um, uh, uh, the, the audio purely or first for, for podcasts, only for podcasts. Uh, and then you've got all, loads of different kinds of podcasts, some of which are familiar to us as programs and some of those which aren't. We, we basically use this, this very broad categorization. So uh, we wanted to know what proportion were kind of daily news and current affairs kind of things. These might be radio programs uh, that are then uh, people catch on up on in podcasts, or it may be some of those native ones like the daily or post reports. Uh, then we have talk interview, uh, uh, unscripted podcasts. I guess Slate, maybe you could say, were the inventors of this format with their gab fests, political gab fests. They now do a whole load of other ones. Um, uh, and then there's catch up like you know Nigel Farage also in that sort of uh, interview format. Then episodic series, so this is a bit like you know Netflix series one, series two, so serial, teacher's pet. Um, this is a very popular genre. And then you have these sort of documentary strands um, into which people put um, different different stories each week. Uh, so P3 from uh, Swedish Radio would be a good example of that. And then. Audio long reads, so um, these are essentially text articles that are read out but made available as podcasts. So these are just some of the categorizations that that we came up with. And in terms of the numbers, so looking at the top 200 podcasts across uh, the five countries we looked at, you can see that the majority are these uh, talk and interview shows. And that's partly because they're just really easy and cheap to produce. A lot of Uh, digital born outlets and newspapers really go for these because you can reuse all of that talent in your newsroom uh, and often journalists have a lot to say (laughs) and uh, you just need to put a microphone in front of them and it's really quite easy to do and some of them if they're great personalities are really attracting very significant numbers of people. Episodic series is the other really interesting one so um, uh, examples I've kind of ex- explored some of them already, but uh, one of my favourites in the last year or so was uh, Tunnel Twenty Nine. Do people s- hit, listen to that from the BBC? It's a show. It, it's essentially the documentary story of people escaping from East Germany in the 1960s through various tunnels. Uh, it's brilliantly put together. It was also a hit on. If you haven't listened to it, look it out. Um, was also um, a hit back on radio. So it's an example of sort of podcast first commissioning that's going back onto radio, uh, which many of the broadcasters are doing now. Uh, true crime, I mean, look at the Australians going for their true crime. 51% of all of the podcasts we categorise true crime. Uh, I won't comment on, on that anymore. Uh, so some differences between countries, but essentially sort of a couple of blobs. What's interesting is that we're starting to see sort of independent producers. So in terms of, of people producing it, generally it is broadcasters who are producing the most. That's partly because of the catch-up radio side. And then you have um, print uh, newspapers, uh, or from a legacy print background, um, producing a lot of stuff now because it's uh, becoming a core cool part of their strategy. But you also have these independent producers. Uh, so an example in Australia is um, a TV network called Ten, who've basically spun out a podcast studio, and they've got a couple of breakout hits there. You see on the left, in France, you have uh, Injustices, which was about um, uh, sexism in French journalism, basically a sort of episodic... Uh, series and then you've got these very big studios now in the US like Wondery and Gimlet uh, who were bought by Spotify but Wondery uh, produced uh, are producing these sort of they're going for the Netflix model Dr. Death produced in seven languages uh, and uh, then a lot of these podcasts are then being licensed on for TV series so a lot of the money 
a lot of the business model is actually about making great episodic series that you prove have an audience and then you make a television version, uh, which is quite interesting. So we're seeing a lot more of that. In the UK, much less of these sort of independent studios, partly because of the size of the BBC. Uh, but in France, we're starting to see it. In Australia, we're starting to see it. Uh, so it's a sort of interesting development. So um, of all the podcasts we listen to in the UK, how many are produced by uh, UK providers? Uh, so uh, you can see here in the UK, it's about 57%. So the pink slices essentially are us listening to other English language podcasts, particularly American and Australian episodic series. Um, in the US, it's much more people are listening to stuff that's produced in the US. <clears throat> and that's partly because the quality is so high there, it's really hard for others to break in. And I would expect those... Uh, in other countries, we'll see um, more domestically produced stuff being produced over time as the industry grows. Uh, France, slightly different issue. So most of the podcasts in France listen to are French, in French, and it's really much more to do with the language barrier. Uh, and most of the podcasts that are being listened to are from uh, French radio, so Radio France and various other uh, radio producers. So what about these daily news podcasts? I'm really intrigued by these. Personally, I listen to a lot of them. It's become a really key part of, my, of, our, of our routine. In the five countries, we basically tracked the, um, the growth of these. And you can see one of the first was the GIST, in, the GIST in, uh, from Slate in 2014. Uh, and then the daily in 2017, you can really see how that has grown. So there's probably more, but we tracked about 60 of these. Uh, in the five countries we've been looking at. And you can see some of the recent ones, the intelligence from The Economist, uh, today in focus from The Guardian, uh, the leader from The Evening Standard, which launched recently. And uh, we also categorized the length of these. So what's really interesting is to break some of these down to look at what the organizations behind them are trying to achieve. So right at the bottom here, you have a whole little cluster of uh, podcasts between one and five minutes. And these are essentially... Um, a lot of them are produced by broadcasters like NPR's News Now. They're aimed at quick updates via voice devices or via on-demand, other on-demand opportunities. And I think this micro-briefing thing is going to become much more important as the distribution through platforms like Spotify increases over the next few years. So we'll come back to that. News Roundups is much more about the uh, update me in the morning, so it's part of your routine. 8 to 15 minutes, so can I, can I get as part of that routine? Examples would be um, Omnipod in Sweden, um, up first from uh, NPR, um, FT's business briefings, are, are, are another one's about sort of 15 minutes or so. And then you've got these deep dives, so um, the daily, you can see there about 25 minutes, today in focus. This is essentially to hit your morning commute, so the reason these are about 25 minutes is essentially to hit the commute times. Um, and uh, these are amongst uh, the most successful in terms of, um, yeah, so this just shows the sort of popularity, relative popularity based on the Apple episode charts. Uh, yeah, you can see the deep dives daily, uh, number one in the US today and focus in the UK. Um, the daily, I think, has two million daily listeners now, two million daily listeners. So that is really substantial audiences that it's taken away from. Uh, from broadcast or from other kinds of media. Today in Focus, um, in just over a year, has built an audience that is bigger than, than buys the print newspaper. So hundreds of thousands of people listen every day, and they listen 80% of the, of the time through. So this is uh, really very, very successful in terms of engagement, in terms of numbers. Uh, in, the U in Australia, you've got the signal from, uh, this is aimed at younger people. This is an ABC. Um, uh, but interestingly, a lot of digital-born brands are uh, able to disrupt because they got in early. So a lot of the newspapers have not done it yet. So we're seeing a gap in the market. Uh, and then Sweden's slightly different. You've actually not got so many of those deep dives. And a lot of the ones that are most successful tend to be um, more the, the bulletins. How hard is it to do? Um, well, we know the New York Times has 15 people working on the daily. 15 out of a, an audio department of 30. Um, the Economist has eight. The Guardian has eight. So that's eight dedicated people. And of course, they have the resources of the whole newsroom as well. But this is actually a very significant investment. Uh, but some of the smaller ones we talk to have an audience, have um, staffing around four to five. And you can see the, the makeup there. So you need a great host. You need an executive producer. 
well, I'm not sure you do, but you need, <laughs> you need somebody in charge, I suppose. You need producers, uh, and you need uh, the sound designer is a really, really interesting uh, role within, within these daily news podcasts. Sometimes people are bringing talent in from outside from radio. Other times it's homegrown, as in the case of uh, Michael Barbaro. Can you make any money? So you're investing lots of, um, lots of uh, resources into it. Um, yes, apparently. So The Economist, which has been going for about a year, I think almost exactly a year, has an audience of over 500,000 listening to uh, at least two to three episodes a week. And they are already cash positive. So I think they were cash positive within the first six months. And what they said this is that, um, as you can see there, you know, there's been so much demand for sponsorship, it more than pays for itself. And, and talking to advertising agencies about um, the change in the last year, it's really blue chip advertisers moving in and actually almost asking for podcast space. Uh, so this has happened in the UK, um, but it's not happened yet elsewhere. So just, you know, some of the other markets we, we looked at or we talked to, uh, Denmark, for example, Sweden, you're not seeing the same uh, advertising. So most of those daily news podcasts are not making money in smaller markets. Interestingly, Politican, which is behind this podcast, uh, offers it for free part of the week, and the rest of the week it's part of their subscription package. So I think you're going to see more of a mix of advertising and subscription over time, although currently most of it is around advertising. Why are people doing it? So again, we talked to the, the New York Times, the BBC, all these different publishers about what they're doing and why, and uh, a lot of it is about this search for habit and loyalty. So you know, digital has fragmented our attention, we get reach, but are we really getting loyalty? Are we getting something that's valuable? And what podcasts are amazing at is, is delivering time, but also you know, the Daily is a new front page, a showcase for everything that New York, journalism is about, uh, New York Times journalism is about that brings in a new generation of subscribers. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely core to the way in which they're thinking about it. And the younger audiences, that's a big motivation for the Financial Times, New York Times because they're subscription businesses that need that next generation, um, but also for the radio broadcasters who are losing uh, younger people uh, very fast, particularly around television, but also around radio now as they move to on demand. So podcast audiences are 20 years younger. So this is also about future-proofing the BBC or Swedish radio or Radio France. So these are the core reasons behind the, you know, the, the money side. So just finally, um, platforms and intermediaries, which I think is just one of the most fascinating parts of the story and is, uh, is going to really shape how audio changes over the next few years. So Apple was um, you know, the dominant platform, podcasting. Uh, you know, the, the word comes from, from, from the iPod and that association and the iPhone. And uh, we're really st starting to see that change. So 57% uh, still Apple podcast. This is US data. Uh, Spotify has grown, has doubled in the last year, and the latest data I'm seeing from the UK shows more like 20, 25% now from Spotify. So huge change in combination with Google putting podcasts into search results. This is really taking it out of the latte drinking elites and to a much, much wider audience, which is, you know, I think um, uh, podcasting currently is, is being a little bit niche. So Spotify, you know that they're investing 500 million uh, through acquisitions of companies and investment in original content as well. Just some of the things they've done, some of the most successful, they bought up original content, in this case German comedians. Uh, one of the most successful podcasts in Germany, now exclusively on Spotify. Another amazing podcast I can recommend, the, the story of The Clash, which was a co-production between the BBC Studios and Spotify itself. Um, absolutely fantastic. And you can see how you know you listen to the radio program and then the synergy with, with music documentaries. So you've got the playlists, you can just sort of continue your journey uh, through music. So you can see why Spotify are kind of interested in this. And then the launch of Daily Drive, I think is, is, uh, is fascinating. It's mainly just launched in the US, I think so far, uh, uh, and Sweden, <laughs> okay. But I think what basically what that is, it's um, trying to recreate uh, that combination of short snippets of news or weather and then an automated playlist of your favorite tracks. And it just basically automate, remembers what you, what you deliver. So I think in theory, an incredibly compelling experience that they're planning to roll out this year. So Spotify is gonna be huge. At the same time, you've got the broadcasters completely 
uh, changing their strategy. So it's not BBC iPlayer Radio anymore. It's BBC Sounds with a podcast uh, very prominently uh, displayed here. They're trying to create their own platforms. They want younger people and older people to come directly to them. They don't want to go through Google. They don't want to be disaggregated. This is a, this is a huge battle. And if you've been trying to access um, BBC podcasts through Google recently, through, through Google Home, you won't be able to because there's currently a dispute going on between the BBC and Google. And many of the other broadcasters are having similar disputes. We're going to see a lot more of that this year. So who is going to control the experience in audio is going to be one of the, the, the sort of key issues. And then um, have we reached peak podcasts? No, we haven't. Um, so what's going to drive it further, I think, is partly, um, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, people with these ridiculous things hanging out their ears. Uh, I might have a pair myself. Uh, very big hot ticket item at Christmas. Uh, I think they've doubled in, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, very unscientific poll of people walking around London. Um, so I think this is going to be one of the big hits of the year, and it's partly because, um, I mean, they are fantastic, and the noise cancelling is, is the thing that's been missing, and the, the pros, they're really expensive, but amazing. So I think, you know, just the quality of that, the way in which you're going to be on interact with the internet through audio and through touch of these things is going to be a huge uh, change, combined with the growth that we're seeing in voice-activated devices, pretty much doubling year on year, not being used very much for news, but, but I think still very relevant, and then the way in which these um, on-demand technologies are coming into the car. So we've been talking about this for years, it hasn't really happened, but cars this year are coming off the, um, the, the, the production line with um, Apple and Google uh, operating systems in there to make it more frictionless. All of that will drive audio further. So what does all that add up to? Um, so podcasting is, um, I'm not sure the term will survive much longer. It's moving out of its uh, cottage industry, rather, rather lovely um, ha um, history, into a more professionalized state, a much more commercialized state. The money's coming in. Uh, the quality of the content is coming in. Audience demand is growing. You've got this sort of uh, virtuous cycle going on right now. Oh, interesting. Um, News and politics is a major driver of usage, so um, punching above its weight, as I say, one of the fastest growing and most popular formats, increasingly profitable, um, but it's not really about that. For me, it's about, it's about habit, it's about loyalty, and it's about coming up with formats that are really engaging uh, younger people as well as older people. And then we're going to see, uh, as I mentioned, some really significant moves this year. I mean, New York Times have already said they're going to spend a lot more on audio, but I would expect some uh, UK publishers to do the same this year. And then um, the whole platform story, I think, is, is fascinating. And I think the, the, the point about that is, is moving it beyond you know, the metropolitan areas, uh, the elites, to, to a wider group of people. And that's what Google, that's what Spotify, I think, will be able to do as well. So um, if you want to read more, uh, you can access the report, uh, so the, news, the podcast one from the Reuters Institute website, the Trends and Predictions, which is just out, and the shameless plug for um, uh, one that's coming out next week, which is tracking the UK election and how people uh, use the media in the UK election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. So we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, hi, my name is Ben. I produce a weekly science news show for the journal Nature. Um, as these things are becoming massively popular now, are you seeing any trends towards publishers putting things behind paywalls? Of course, we're used to getting audio for free since 2005, yeah. but is there any movement in that direction, do you think? Yeah, there is. Um, so um, not very much. That, so for example, the, the Daily have said that uh, they're not going to do it, or I'm not sure they, they, they're not sure they've actually said that, but broadly they say that they're making so much money from the advertising it's not worth it. But I think for other publications, that is a trade-off they're looking at. So particularly, so I think you will see the New York Times doing that, but not with the Daily. And I think you will see uh, the Financial Times have already trialled it as well. So there's some new technology from Acast and others, which allows you to essentially have a Slate, of course, um, give bonus episodes to their Slate Plus um, subscription. So that's the other way of doing it is you give a sort of free service and then you hold back some additional material as part of the subscription. Uh, and then of course you've got a whole load of providers like Luminary and others who are trying to create the sort of paid for 
um, subscription model like Netflix. So you subscribe to the best podcasts and they're only available, they're exclusive. I think that's going to be really hard, um, certainly around news and science content. Um, but, I, but I do think if you have a subscription model, then there are some really nice hybrid models emerging, such as the Slate one. Thanks, Nick. Uh, really interesting. Um, any data or opinions about non-Western countries and podcasts? So I just got back from India, for example. Everybody yeah. and their kind of dog has a smartphone, headphones, all that kind of stuff. Is it a market drive for cracking or any thoughts on that? Thanks. Uh, Yes, I think it is, particularly you know because of uh, because audio is uh, you know big and, and, and it, I mean there's a lot of things holding it back. You have to be clear. So l l I think it's going to be different in different countries. So Brazil, it's absolutely exploding right now. Data is cheap. Um, uh, Google and others are, are, are really pushing into Brazil. Uh, in Africa, where I was recently. Um, Depending on the country, the data charges are just way too high, so podcasting is going absolutely nowhere. So again, a lot of this will, will depend on the, on the circumstances. Um, and the US, to me, is still miles ahead in terms of professionalization, in terms of, of the levels of usage. So although in our data we do see podcasts being consumed elsewhere, uh, it doesn't feel to me to be at the, same, at the same level yet. So I think it will come. There's absolutely huge opportunities. I think the, re, you know, the core drivers that I talked about uh, are going to be the same in, in every country, but I think will happen at different paces. Hi, Nick. Um, you've got Today in Focus from The Guardian as the number one podcast for the UK. It wasn't one I was familiar with, although apparently I subscribed to it, so I must have had some association with that in the past. Um, the BBC, you've got Beyond Stay as number two. Uh, obviously, they've got lots of different podcasts. When you look at the aggregates of what they're doing versus everybody else, are they a long way up there, or are these other brands? Yeah, I, I mean, it is really hard to get accurate podcast numbers, and um, that's why I didn't really put any numbers on there. Um, it depends what you're looking at, and, uh, of course, podcast numbers are often counted as downloads as well as streams, so there's a new IB2 st standard. Um, but in general, uh, absolutely, of course, the BBC, and we, we did do this in report, is by far the biggest in terms of the numbers. And in most countries, it is the broadcasters because they're producing so much stuff. Um, but I think uh, broadcasters are being disrupted, and they're being disrupted in a very significant way. So, you know, they are quite, they, they see it as an opportunity to get those younger audiences, but they, fundamentally, it's going to be uh, difficult for them because previously had a monopoly on audio, and now they don't. So their market share is bound to go down. Hi. Um, where do you see the competition being in between the two, the, the podcasts? Do you see, for example, I mean, some, some of the daily podcasts are kind of repeating the same themes each day. Yeah. Um, do you see people trying to kind of compete with more serial based podcasts or are we going to see um are, are we trying to are people going to try and get each other's po podcast listeners from each other you know are we going to get the telegraphs listeners trying to go to the times etc right know, where do you see that in the, in the yeah I, it's a really good point i i i'm not sure my sense is that you will you'll have in each country two or three big successful daily news podcasts um, i'm not sure that it's going to be like everyone's going to Everyone's going to have a daily news podcast. I'm not sure that's the right thing. I think you'll have two or three that will be successful. And then I think the key thing is for others who are going into audio to find some of those other niches. And I think there's a lot of different possibilities. You know, I've mentioned the short form, which I think is going to become much more important, probably more suited to broadcasters. But I think um, there's loads of different possibilities and niches for print publishers to get involved in different kinds of things, even if it's not a daily news podcast. But I agree. If you look around and you look at all the daily news podcasts, they are all covering the same subjects. So if you listen to them all, you'd go mad. Hi. Some of those staffing numbers are huge. Are you seeing legacy publishers moving their video um, staffing or resources away from um, video to podcasting? Sure. I mean, some of them um, have, you know, it was, everyone was talking about the pivot to video, now they're talking about the pivot to audio. But if you take a publisher like Vox, for example, they basically got out of most of the video stuff they're doing and they invested very heavily in audio. So they, they had 100 podcasts a year ago, they've got 200 now. 200 podcasts, and they have built a huge business off the back of that that is delivering much of their revenue. 
So um, a number of people have p uh, pivoted. Uh, others, like BuzzFeed, pivoted out of audio and, uh, and have continued working in, in video. So I think there are clearly opportunities in both. Um, but uh, people broadly have been disappointed so far with the a lot of the returns from video, and um, some are more hopeful about audio. Got one over here. Um, I was wondering if you had the data on what type of news it is, because if it's just general news or if we have more data on politics-specific news or music-specific news. Uh, what, what? Sorry, what, what people are listening to in terms of the types of news? Yeah, because I assume general news are equivalent. On yeah, so I mean, the, the daily news podcasts are, are really sort of current affairs. So they're like taking, um, well, I suppose some of the, the update ones are just a bit like you'd hear on the radio, sort of three items, current affairs items put together. So in that sense, they're general news. But news, news works, doesn't really work so well in an on-demand way uh, yet. Um, in terms of other stuff, um, there is a lot of uh, very successful sports podcasting. Um, so The Athletic have launched a whole load of new podcasts in the UK. Those are, by the way, subscription podcasts. They're part of the subscription. Um, are they? No, they're, they're free. That's right. They're, out, they're outside the paywall, I think. The, yeah. But I think they have plans to bring some of them in, inside. Uh, so it is the full range of things, you know, the full range of things from daily news um, through to uh, the niches uh, and then... Um, uh, yeah, uh, 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 more besides. Last one. What would be your advice for a medium-sized publisher deciding to launch a podcast in 2020? And there's a brilliant gif of this. I don't know if you've seen it, of just like surfers on the beach and there's millions of them and they're all falling over each other. What would your advice be? Um, I'll, um, I'll talk to you about that later and talk, talk to you about my consultancy fees. Um, but I think... That, yeah. That's the best way of, uh, of answering that extremely clever and good question. On that note, a huge round of applause for Nick Newman. Thank you very much indeed.